Great news. There's a quick way you can save money. Switch to GEICO. GEICO could help you get great coverage at a great price. And it only takes 15 minutes to see if you could save 15% or more on car insurance. Go to GEICO.com today and see how much you could save. It has been determined that the receiver did not maintain possession. Ladies and gentlemen, apparently Des caught it. Clearly it's a catch been under review all this time and now uh, it looks like there's some sanity papa john's pizza for jerry jones mm. well the feud is fuming wait a minute jerry you're not the most powerful guy in this league ncaa is is, 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 is correct i wish ncaa players understood the power that they now have i'm all for that What you see may change your perception of any sporting event. Get this. Shoot this. Welcome to Outside the Lines. I'm Kate Fagan, sitting in for Bob Lee. The future of the NFL catch is being decided right now in Indianapolis, and that is today's big story. Official workouts at the NFL Combine don't start until Friday, but the more nuanced work of the competition committee has already begun. At the top of the committee's to-do list has been refining, redefining the definition of a catch. In fact, after Tuesday's meeting, New York Giants owner and committee member John Mara said the group was in agreement that controversial call reversals on Des Bryant in 2014, that one right there, and Calvin Johnson in 2010 should have been catches. So now that the committee seems to have found common ground, they're charged with an even more difficult task writing the proper language into the rule book to communicate to referees precisely how to interpret each play. Now, this is just one of many subplots coming out of Indy, NFL's off-season hub. Also on the menu, continued friction between Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones and Commissioner Roger Goodell, as Jones will appeal the NFL's decision to seek $2 million as a reimbursement for the legal fees Owners incurred from Jones's appeal of Ezekiel Elliott's suspension and his threatened lawsuit to block Goodell's contract extension. All right. With the latest on all things NFL, we are now joined live from Indianapolis by NFL insider Lewis Riddick. All right, Lewis, let's start here. What changes can we expect to see to the rule book definition of a catch? Well, Ken, I think first and foremost, you're going to see the ground be eliminated as a determining factor in what is a catch and what isn't a catch. Now, what they're going to have to determine, though, is what actually does uh, – what, how can you identify possession, meaning – two steps, one step, what is a football move? I think those kind of things are going to need to be written into the language. But as far as the ground determining being a factor, surviving the ground, that ridiculous you know, language that you heard used all this year in some of the most controversial calls, I think you'll see that eliminated. As far as you know, maybe down on the goal line, I think things will be a little bit different. I think as long as a receiver has possession, crosses the plane of the goal line again, and then hits the ground, again, the ground will be eliminated there. But I think those two plays that, uh, that Mr. Meyer is talking about with Calvin Johnson, with Des Brown, I think everyone who has watched football for whatever kind of whatever portion of your life that you've watched understands that those are the kind of things that common sense should rule the day. It's just that you now need to clean it up a little bit for the referees as far as establish, establishing possession. But the whole surviving the ground thing, I think, is going to go by the wayside and rightfully so. Yeah, I mean, it seems like at some degree it's a simplicity that we need to get back to when it comes to yeah. this particular definition. Are you getting the sense from who, people you're talking to that like, Getting back to even simpler language as opposed to, like, adding in even more information will be the way to go? Well, sure, without a doubt. And I think that serves everyone. That serves the fans. That serves the coaches. I think that serves the best interest of the game because, obviously, people across all viewership spectrums, so to speak, are kind of tired of seeing the game slowed down to the point of where – you're trying to be perfect in a game that has a lot of inherent imperfections in it. Now, that doesn't say that you should, you know, leave everything to chance here and, and have, you know, mistakes being made over and over again in crucial situations. But when it comes to the catch thing, it's kind of gotten a little bit out of hand. Again, I don't want to sound redundant about it, but the whole surviving the ground yeah. thing is something I never did understand. But establishing possession will need to be written into the rule book so officials across the league can uniformly apply the proper rules and everyone's happy and the game can kind of progress and move on. Right. So news coming out of Indy about the 16% increase in concussions overall actually carrying through the playoffs. And I know that the head, neck, and spine committee meeting was yesterday. What information 
that's coming out of that meeting? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one, one of the things that was most intriguing to me was the fact that, you know, the self-reporting part of things, the awareness on the part of players to go ahead and be honest with medical staffs and training staffs about how they're feeling and relaying some of those symptoms, you know, wh- how big of a part was that in the uptick in terms of the percentage increase in concussions? How much, how, how, how big of a factor was that in it? I think that's something that needs to be investigated. I think that's something that's important. I think that's something we need to look at before we get too alarmed over the fact that concussions are increasing because look i think the nfl has done a good job of educating players about the dangers of concussions the dangers of playing football recklessly so to speak meaning playing it with your head and trying to eliminate those headshots and protect players i think they've done a good job of doing that and i I think there's only so much further you can really go with that before you really start damaging the integrity or rather the basic you know tenets of the game and and making it look totally different. So I think, you know, there's some risk that's going to be inherent as far as head trauma in the NFL that we're just not going to be able to get away with. But I think the league is doing its due diligence and doing the right thing in terms of trying to protect the players. One more thing before I let you go. Eastman's Todd Archer saying that the hearing for Jerry Jones getting the reimbursement of the legal fees, $2 million, this this hearing is set for Monday. Now, we've only got a few seconds here, but what are you hearing about the tensions between Jerry Jones and the NFL? Well, I, look, Jerry Jones has a long history of doing things his way. He has a long history of bucking con- conventional wisdom. And he has a ho- long history of establishing, I mean, of, of really challenging the establishment. And that's fine, you know. So, but that comes with consequences sometimes. And right now, it may be, you know, a couple million dollar consequence yep. as far as how he handled this whole thing as far as the commissioner's salary is concerned. So, business right. as usual. <laughs> Lewis Riddick at the NFL Combine in Indy. Thanks for your time. You got it. And more news from the NFL and Jerry Jones's world. The league and Papa John's have mutually agreed to end official league sponsorship. Now, a few important contextual facts. Papa John's is the pizza company that made news last year when its founder, John Schnatter, said sales had dropped after and because of players kneeling. Also of note, Jerry Jones is part owner of 120 Papa John's stores. ESPN business reporter Darren Ravel tweeted the joint statement from the NFL and Papa John's, and he joins us now. All right, Darren, why did Papa John's and the NFL split? Well, I think, Kate, it's just the fact that there was just a lot of toxicity between the two. I mean, uh, John Schnatter uh, resigned as CEO on January 1st, um, but I think they felt that it was just better that they separate after, again, on this earnings call, uh, in November, he just completely lambasted the league, uh, called uh, into question the leadership. Uh, and I, I just feel like, you know, they had this deal. It was going to run through 2020. And I feel like even though Schnatter was gone, uh, he was still on the board. There was just a toxic atmosphere there that they felt was uh, not reconcilable. And was that an atmosphere that can be directly attributed to the players kneeling, or was it something that had been brewing between these two companies earlier? You know, that's a a great question. Um, You know, as a big booster at the University of Louisville, we know that uh, John Schnatter uh, does speak his mind. He has no edit button, Uh, but obviously he prepared to make these comments because when he did on November 1st, he essentially read them from a script, so they were premeditated. Um, I would say that, you know, the, the question always is, was it the NFL or was it because Papa John's was behind on technology? Um, you look at the replacement in Pizza Hut and Pizza Hut's the leader uh, in ordering uh, off a mobile device. They've invested in technology more than Papa John's has. Domino's has invested in ingredients more than Papa John's has. Uh, so yeah, it's hard to say whether it was the NFL that caused the sales drop, but they did reveal yesterday that Papa John's sales dropped 3.9 percent from October to December as compared to the previous October to December, and that's a that's a humongous difference. Yeah. All right. So more NFL business news here is that the Cowboys are partnering with SeatGeek over Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster being the NFL's partner for ticket sales. Now I know the Cowboys are with the Saints in the fact that they're not a part of the Ticketmaster deal, but Given Jerry Jones's long history, well, long as in like the last year or two of being at odds with the NFL, should we be reading into this? And what does this mean? 
Oh, you can definitely read into it, and I think his being in the uh, being at odds with the NFL goes back to 1995 when he decided to do uh, a Pepsi deal and do an American Express deal when the league deals were American were, were Visa and uh, and Coca Cola. So I would say yes, some of this has to do with the fact that Jerry Jones doesn't want to do what the league. Uh, want, wants to do or has the deal with. And, uh, you know, maybe he'll make a little bit more money, but I doubt the money that he's making with the SeatGeek deal is that much more significant than the Ticketmaster deal. Yes, this does have to do with not doing what the league wants to do. All right, Darren Ravel, thank you very much. And coming up, basketball's it. biggest stars try to solve the sport's biggest crisis. Attention shoppers, clean up on aisle 14. Clean up on aisle 14. Someone dropped a jar of pickles. 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 Beatboxing at a big box store. Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. A red minivan has the lights on in the parking lot. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Geico. The NCAA is tangled up in wiretaps and accusations of payments to athletes and questions about what the future of the sport at the college level could and should look like. All this in the wake of the FBI's two-year investigation into college basketball that resulted in arrests and suspensions. And we've only seen a fraction of the evidence. Now, amid this chaos, NBA stars have offered insight and opinion on how to solve the problem. What should be the feeder system for the league? The NCAA? Or should the NBA make its development league, the G League, 